Mahalo, LB. Uh, aloha mai kako. I'm Thomas. Uh, thanks for the introduction, LB. Um, I want to acknowledge and thank all of you for coming. I can see across the room we have people from all across Hawaii. Um, thank you for taking time away from your pastures, from your kitchens, your offices, and your day-to-day -day life to come here and join in this fireside chat and discussion about animal farming. We have encountered a lot of interest, it's fair to say, um, on the subject of today's iteration of the Future of, Farm, uh, Future of Food and Agriculture in Hawaii series. So I'd just first like to preface this conversation um, and discussion. Everyone here is a stakeholder in the food system. We're all here because we care about it and we care about agriculture, the environment and the future of Hawaii. We value and appreciate the producers of all the food that this archipelago gives us. We recognize everyone's point of view as well. And if you want to share that point of view, we will be having a community discussion afterwards where we encourage you all to stay and talk and listen to everyone's diverse points of view. I also wanted to say that the conversation of whether or not we should be consuming animals is a valid question. It's a moral question, but today is not the day for that. So please do, um, yeah, keep tuned. We might be able to do a conversation dedicated to that, but today's not the day. We're, so yes, we're here to talk constructively and critically about the food system with the aim of promoting health, equity, resilience, and sustainability of Hawaii and its people. We're not here to unduly attack any single party, but to raise questions about the current food system and, the, and chart a path towards one that achieves, that achieves human and planetary health with an eye towards creating a sustainable and equitable future. So we can, and we must be both critical and civil. Food systems will continue to play a defining role in global environmental change, human health, and socioeconomic stability. An integral part of the food system is animal agriculture, which itself has played a critical role in our development on a global scale. It continues to play an important role and plays a key role in the Hawaii's food system, past, present, and future. Worldwide, animal farming is, has significantly intensified in past decades. A key part of that intensification has been thanks to concentrated animal feeding operations, often referred to as CAFOs. Such operations are classified as agricultural facilities that house and feed large numbers of animals in a confined space for 45 days or more within a 12 month period. I'm sure we all have an image in our mind of what that might look like, and there are a few examples of that kind of operation here in Hawaii. But this discussion is dedicated to the recent developments in agri animal agriculture here in Hawaii, some of it on an industrial scale, along with some of its known ecological, social, and economic costs and benefits. We'll also touch on what hasn't developed in Hawaii's food system. We want to see Hawaii's agricultural system grow to a point where we can better feed ourselves at all times, good or bad. So this conversation will explore some best practices in animal agriculture to promote people's health, equity, resilience, and sustainability. Okay, so with me tonight is Chad Buck, owner of Hawaii Food Service Alliance. The Food Service Alliance is locally owned and one of Hawaii's largest, if not the largest, supplier of perishable food. In Hawaii, HFA represents and distributes for more than 20 local manufacturers, and they are the largest distributor of eggs and local beef across the island island chain. Specializing in ocean and air freight of highly perishable products, HFA owns and operates food safety compliant warehousing and distribution facilities on Oahu, Maui, Kauai, Big Island, and in Long Beach, California. They supply everyone from Costco and Sam's Club to Foodland and Safeway. Additionally, Chad and his wife recently purchased the assets of the former Big Island Dairy in Hamakua, which closed several years ago and settled a lawsuit against it for alleged violations of the Clayton Water Act. Moving forward, the Bucks have committed to managing the operation for the benefit of Hawaii. 
and not replicating the previous model. So with that very long, arduous intro, Chad, I have my first question for you. <laughs> um, can you please share with us your first-hand experience with the former Big Island Dairy operation? Sure. Um, I remember meeting the Whitesides when they first came over, and I think I was introduced um, by either Jerry Kahana or Scott Enright. And my hopes were very high for a very much needed operation that would provide milk, uh, dairy products for the state. Over the last probably 20, 30 years prior to that, um, I think it was the heptachlor incident back in the 80s that uh, dairy cows eating uh, the, the pineapple from the fields and so on. They had some contaminants in the milk and so that stopped local milk and that started mainland milk coming over and when the mainland milk started coming over, it proved to be a very economically sound, profitable way to do that. And so um, there was no real interest. This is my view, by the way. This is just my opinion on all this stuff. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm involved in four lawsuits. And so my attorney gave me some pretty direct instructions regarding what I can say and what I can't say. So all this is my opinion. Um, only my opinion. So, but when it proved to be economically the best way to go to make money, there was no, in my view, real interest. Now, this is a bankrupt company that I'm talking about now. This is Dean Foods, the largest dairy processor on planet Earth at the time. And so there was, didn't seem to be a real interest in starting up dairies again. And so you'd buy Haleakala dairy, You'd stop bottling milk. You'd still call it Haleakala Dairy. You'd still say Hawaii's dairy. You'd still say all that type of thing. And then you'd go to Kauai, and it just went dairy by dairy by dairy. And so you had 20 to 30 local dairies, local families, whose livelihood depended on local food. And they all went away one by one by one by one. And so you're left with one now in Havi that is limping along through litigation now and really struggling to kind of come along and get back up. And so when the white sides came, you had this tremendous expertise. You had agronomists, you had all the science, you had $40 million-ish worth of improvements here. And so there was a great hope that dairy could be done right, come back and start to multiply and start to provide our own dairy. We used to be completely independent on dairy until that heptachlor and then dairy after dairy closed because it was just more profitable to bring a tank of mainland milk, pasteurize it on the West Coast, bring it to Hawaii, repasteurize it again, not labeled it repasteurized, but repasteurize it again and call it Hawaii's dairy. So when the white sides came, there was a concern on my part that if you say Hawaii's dairy on one that's from the mainland and you say Hawaii's dairy on the white sides, there's no differentiation even though it was locally produced, local labor, local cows, local milk. And so it was, you know, how well are you going to fight that fight if there's no differentiation between local and mainland? And so um, there was great hope. What happened next was um, Dean Food slash Metagold went in and uh, lobby, or asked the, told Whitesides and Havi Farm, Botello at the time, that if you don't lower your price, we're not going to buy it anymore. It needs to be mainland plus freight-ish. The news came out, Medigold's refused to buy local unless they lower the price. That essentially put the Whitehead's heads underwater. And every gallon of milk they say that they produce was losing money. So you try to make that up in volume. You're getting crushed economically. You're losing money hand and fist and you start trying to make up in volume that cascaded into a variety of things where they went off the rails. Um, I remember working with, talking with Scott Enright at the time and the frustration that we both had regarding the disregard for the town below, the disregard for what was going on, the mistakes that were being made that shouldn't have been made, the lack of supervision and guardrails and guidelines that a CAFO should have in a state like Hawaii and didn't have. And so there was very little monitoring and the things got worse and worse. And so the citizens of the town had to stand up finally 
enough's enough. Your manures ponds are overflowing. They're in our gulches. The manure's in our homes. It's rushing out into our, the ocean below us where we recreate and have for generations. And so this whole thing is going off the rails. And so it took the town to stand up. All I think, you know, I'm pretty good at oversimplifying things. I, I think what would have helped tremendously is if the state had guardrails and guidelines and the monitoring systems from the Department of Health and the follow-ups that need to be so you're not taken advantage of or that these things don't happen and don't hurt the community. And so that turned out to a lawsuit. The lawsuit moved them away. They were trying to get into their own production. They built another $10 million processing plant, a creamery, a bottling plant, butter production, and a cheesery. All FISMA compliant, roughly $10 million, operated it for less than 90 days. We brought them to market, and less than 90 days later, they packed up, left the lights on, and left town. All that product, all that infrastructure, you got two twin 80,000 square foot free stalls, you've got a state-of-the-art processing plant, all left in place, and then they put it up to auction, and uh, it was gonna get FOB auction, meaning where you would finally pay for it is Long Beach, so all that was gonna get cut up, put in containers, and whatever price you paid would put it back to the continent, Port of Long Beach. My wife and I um, felt very strongly that that infrastructure should stay in Hawaii. That infrastructure should, it was state of the art, it's still state of the art. The forklift has 57 hours on it. It's crazy what was left in place. I, I use a lot of forklifts, so that's important. And so we're going through there and we're going, holy smokes, it's like they just deserted the place, literally didn't turn off the lights and left. And so we felt like we had no plans, we're not dairy farmers, we're not farmers, but we felt like that equipment and that technology needed to stay in the state for the people of Hawaii, however this turns out. And so on December 31st, 2020, at 2 p.m., the check went over and I'd asked them not to go to auction, that we would buy it without a single plan, not the brightest businessman, admittedly, but we're gonna buy it, we're gonna take it, we're gonna figure it out as we go. Mind you, this was on the throes, this is 2020 December, vaccines aren't out yet, the state's been locked up, there's no economy, we're seeing historic disruption to the food supply coming into the state. 2020, and COVID's impact into a state that is woefully unprepared to feed its own population, that we have abdicated that role and we push that elsewhere and we're dependent on the mainland, on the continent, on others who don't live here, haven't lived here. And, and, and here we are 2,500 miles away from everywhere. And so, you know, we're walking through this and, and so we were highly motivated to know we don't know what we're doing, but the only thing we do know is we need to take this into, keep it in Hawaii, invest the money, and then figure it out with the community. So that was a really long way of how we got introduced to the Ocala Dairy and the first CAFO that I had personal experience with, but I, I hope that answered your question, and maybe the next two or three. Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> yes, well, I understand there's been some rather significant work that you've done since then in terms of working with the community to figure out which way you want to go with this. Yeah. Dealing with what you're going to do with all of that equipment, um, whether you want to keep cows on the land, um, whether you want to be producing dairy, all of that kind of thing. So I understand you've been moving forward with that, have you not? Yeah, the, you know, so what the first thing that we did, um, so that was coming out of a lawsuit and there was multiple people came into Hawaii, all outside Hawaii came in and said, you got all those assets, you got all that, that's not me. All those assets, all the things that are going on that you have and you have in place. So there's a lot of mainland investors that wanted to come and said, we're just gonna do it, but we're gonna do it right. Our, car, our cows will be smaller, I'll do it. So you had all these groups coming in to say that they, what they were gonna do. 
And there was just a general distrust that you have a CAFO on the, on, on, on the, on the slopes of Mauna Kea aimed directly over the town of Ocala with tremendous waste. And so the town was not ready, clearly, ever to have a CAFO back up on the hill above them. So we, on a Sunday, uh, my wife and I uh, reached out to the town and the lawyers and, and the people that had sued uh, the white sides to get them out of town because they were, weren't going to deal with us anymore. We showed up on an early Sunday morning. I thought the meeting was going to take about an hour. They pulled up. It was the first time they were on site. They said they were forbidden from day one to coming up. Not how you do things in Hawaii. I was shocked that that was the news. That's what they said. So they're now... We're in the bottling plant. We're showing. We say, "What would you like us? What would you like to see happen here?" And the immediate answer was, "Pack up your shit and leave." And I, well, besides that, what should we? What could we do? And so we started talking. And and how do we, you know, in, embrace the community? How do we act like a steward with the community, with the people of Ocala and Paui, all all the surrounding communities? And so five hours later, we were in their homes in Ocala. We, we took a five-hour journey through one of the most uh, biggest ecological disasters, agriculturally-wise, and, and just really learned, really listened. And by the end of the day, we knew their kids. We knew their story. They knew ours. And we had, we have zero plan whatsoever unless it involves the community. Unless it involves you, we're not moving forward. Um, and so that, that was kind of that first step, because if you don't take that first step, if you don't embrace the community, if you don't have buy-in from the community, um, you're not going to go anywhere in this state, and you shouldn't go anywhere in this state. Uh, thank you, Chad. One, one thing I'm wondering is perhaps it would be best if, we could, if you could perhaps tell us what exactly led to the, the clean water infringements. So you're on the slopes of Mauna Kea, you have a grade there that if you look at Hawaii law, you have a no-till law. You shouldn't till it because you're going to expose it. Rains a bit in Ocala. And so if that rain pushes the topsoils down, it's going to go into the gulch system. It's going to end up in the oceans and so on. And if you look, I mean, I've got lots of pictures. But if you look at some of the pictures, including the brochures, you've got a plowed bank all up and down the slopes of the farm um, in Hamakua. And that washed down. They had manure ponds. They washed down. And knowing that there was manure up there, whether it's, you know, it's all the same color, and so that coming down the streams, all that stuff entering the towns, all that was going on, and, 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 and this wasn't just like, oh, one event. This was multiple events, multiple events where this was happening and, and really just alarming, like who's in control here? Where's the state? Where's, how are we going to protect our people and, and the town and, and the families there and the ocean and all that? And so that's what caused it. And I think it's important to note that out of every place on planet Earth, Hawaii is probably the most CAFO unfriendly place topography wise. Um, Soil-wise, you got volcanic soil, you got gulch systems that lead directly into the ocean, you got everything gravity-fed directly into the ocean, and so you are either with, with, with volcanic soil, and if we've all learned this with Red Hill, you are so close to the aquifer in a big hurry, and if it's not going there, it's either aquifer or ocean, and so if you don't have tight controls, tight monitoring, and the systems in place, you are begging for a disaster when you're here, and so you need those guardrails and guidelines. Excellent, thank you. So um, I guess it begs the question, what, what is it that you, what is your plan for, for the land? What is your plan for the, the very state-of-the-art facilities? So um, we are, when we first went to, um, bought it, and now it's like, well, I just spent a whole lot of money on some infrastructure, and I don't have a DOA lease. Again, you know, um, I, I shoot typically before I aim. And so it's just, you know, so, so we're, we go to the Department of Ag, 
And um, I, I should interrupt just real quickly. Morris Atta is here. And if there's a hero at the Department of Ag in Hawaii, it's Morris Atta. I hope your wife's here to hear this, Morris. The um, Morris. Morris doesn't just have Morris's job. Morris has about five other hats that he has to wear, and he's interchanging them every single day. And this isn't just a five-day-a-week job. This is a seven-day-a-week job. But this is my first introduction to the Department of Ag, different chair at the time. And we just did this. We went through. We hired attorneys. We went through the process of what does it take for an inex inexperienced person like myself, never milked a cow in my life, to buy a dairy in Hawaii, and then to come and get at least to come over. And so our attorneys, who are paid by the hour, um, said, check the box, reasonably assumed to have run a successful operation. And so I'm like, sure, I think that's right. I've got 500 some employees. I've got the largest fleet of FISMA compliant trucks in the state, and I don't know how to drive a truck. So I do other things, my skill sets elsewhere. I think I can put together a team that can do this. So I checked that box and they came back and said, no, you don't qualify, shocker. And so at that point, um, we had to jump through all kinds of regulations and a lot of the laws on the books in Hawaii are designed for a very different Hawaii from a very long time ago. And if you're looking for diversification, if you're looking for regenerative ag, if you're looking for all the things that we need to make Hawaii grow and move forward, which we do, you're not gonna find them on any HRS or uh, uh, Hawaii law that's on the books now. And so when I see Senator Richards in the audience, um, I don't think you have a bigger advocate for ag than Senator Richards, and he's new at the Senate. He's been in the county council. He's been advocating for ag. And so when you, when you take a look at what needs to happen in these Hawaii laws, um, it needs to move towards more diversification. And, and the reason I say that is when we went to ag, it's like, that's a dairy only lease. And you're talking about diversification. I want canoe crops, I want avocado, I want banana, I want ulu, I want all, all the stuff to do this because it's never gonna be a CAFO again. It's like, ah, can't do that. It's a dairy only. And I said, well, I don't know a lot about business, but I know enough to know that if I don't diversify and I don't have different, you know, different avenues of revenue here, that's never gonna pencil. Are we gonna do dairy? Yes. It's not, is it gonna be mainland input dairy? No. It's gonna be grass-fed dairy. It's gonna be more like a New Zealand style grass-fed dairy. Ranchers don't raise cattle, ranchers raise grass. And in the dairy situation, and so we have some experts that are actually going back to New Zealand now this weekend, and I'm flying out with my wife to New Zealand next week to spend some time on the farms. We just wanna learn about how to do this in a way. We're looking at starting with 200 and just going, and, and then heavy value add because you have all the value add, but that's way over, that's too much horsepower for just what we're doing there. So we're wanting to make that a community. We've talked with the County of Hawaii when they were doing the Build Back Better under Biden and all the different things going on with COVID. We actually were talking with the county and that and saying, we'll actually look at donating a bunch of this. Let's figure out how to do this together. I've got a day job. I didn't want to buy a dairy to begin with. I also own a slaughterhouse, and I didn't want to do that either on Kauai. But, it, you know, so, but, but I know through the work that I do that Hawaii needs food production more than it needs most things. When you don't feed your own population, something, something is absolutely wrong. And we've made a wrong turn somewhere, and I think you just miss part of your soul when you don't feed your own, care for your own, and watch out for your own. So moving that into more of a collaborative, cooperative work with other farmers. We've talked to uh, uh, other dairy farmer that we talked about growing feed, because their dairy that they were looking at at the time is quite often in drought. So how do we act like a neighbor? How do we act more towards an ahupua'a type system where we can support, convert those buildings over to value add, convert those buildings over to cold storage, and move that through distribution into the marketplace. 
So that's, that's the hope, is that actually turns into more of a shared facility, and we're still feeling our way forward with the community, with the county, with the state, and trying to go, how do we, how do we make this place a community-owned, community-valued place where we can grow our own and take care of our own? Excellent. Thank you. Um, so perhaps zooming out a little bit from uh, just, just dairy um, and, well, in fact, from just Hawaii, um, looking at the national and on, a, on an international level as well, we're currently experiencing rather large uh, egg prices due to the spread of avian flu uh, between wild and domesticated populations. And I think the last count was 58 million uh, birds have been killed um, or had, have had to be killed um, in the last year. Um, readers of CB might have seen a piece that I wrote on this recently. Um, I'm wondering, you know, with, with your uh, vast experience with HFA, can you speak to the impacts of pathogens and how that affects supply chains and pricing uh, now, past and future? Sure. So, so to give you some history on this, 2015 was the last avian flu that rocked the country. Eggs went up. Um, I did not know two of our buyers were coming tonight from HFA. They're sitting in the audience. So um, if, if, to give you an idea of the volume, we move on a weekly basis through our, our physical compliant platform about 350,000 dozen eggs a week. That's a lot of volume. If you want to know the two women that are responsible for that, they're right there. I also see that Villa Rose is here, so don't look back there at our buyers. The, um, so that's a lot of tremendous amount of eggs. By the way, it's Miranda and Eunice that are sitting back there smiling. So with that, we were buying eggs you know, well below 80 cents at one point, large dozen. That rocketed over five bucks. So you take four times 350,000, that's $1.4 million. That's just, that's a really conservative effort. More dollars per week because of what was going on with avian flu. So in 2015, I think it only went up to about $3.80. We rocketed over five. Um, and this runs off an Ernerberry market. And that Ernerberry market that we run off of, so our egg prices change every week based on the demand, based on the, you know, uh, supply and demand around the country. And so we just ride that market every week. And, and so that was a tremendous impact on uh, the cost of protein, which is the cheapest protein that those, particularly the food insecure, can buy. So eggs are an important, important commodity for us. And so that's, that's the impact of that. And so what happened in 2015 was nothing compared to what happened this year. And it, it was typically seasonal. And this turned into just, it didn't stop in the, after the hot, it, it, during the hot months. It just kept going and kept going and farms kept breaking and laying operations kept breaking. Meaning they, when they get avian flu, everything goes down. You don't try to heal the, the sick hens. They all get euthanized because you can't let that spread. Quite often it's spread by the uh, 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 wildlife, et cetera. And so that just turned things upside down. And we're still, we started to drop. We just went up 26 cents today on Ernerberry. We were 16 cents last week, if I remember right. And so now it's starting to come up, but it's coming up because of Easter. So we're just hoping that this starts to mellow out. But a lot of this, in some ways, in, in my opinion, is self-inflicted when you try to put too much under one roof without the controls and it's, it's just, and there's more and more science coming out for this. And so I'm a huge supporter of the locally owned multi-generation egg farms that have been here for generations because we do need that. But that's why eggs cost so much right now. So yes, of course, studies have concluded that there needs to be more controls in place. This is something that you've touched on uh, with Big Island Dairy. Um, of course, none of us want the worst case scenario coming across. 
the Wailua egg farm is, has come in and it's uh, managing an uh, enclosed but uh, cage-free operation. It's got 2,000 uh, birds, 200,000 birds I understand at the minute and uh, because of the increased demand um, from avian flu I understand they're also scaling up um, and also because of the avian flu they're, they're price competitive, very price competitive um, with mainland eggs. So I, I guess I wonder, you know, what can you tell me why in Hawaii it's such a concern then to have such an operation? So, and, and I'll go back to the first statement. I am absolutely for Hawaii to be food independent. That's going to take new laws. That's going to take new focus. That's going to take new champions um, because we haven't championed that. And I associate growing our own food with caring for our own people, and we haven't done that either in my view. And so part of that, if, if you take a look at a CAFO of any size, but let's, let's take a um, laying operation. A, a, a hen lays about a quarter pound of manure a day. You put a million hens, you got a quarter million pounds of manure a day to deal with. Um, if you were to build a town or a complex and say, we're gonna put a quarter million people in this town. We're gonna to put it next to a gulch. That gulch will run straight to the ocean. We're on volcanic soil, but we're gonna do that. But because it's agriculture, we don't need an environmental impact study. It's not by law, you don't need an environmental impact study. So you follow the law, you don't do environmental impact study. I personally believe that that's not the right way to go in Hawaii. If you're coming into here, into the state, surrounded by our communities, with our families, our keiki, our kapuna, and, and into this special place, there should be an environmental impact study. There should be community engagement. I think people want to know what's going on, and that should be first and foremost, because you don't move in Hawaii, shouldn't move, in my opinion, without the community, support of the community, that the community, community is going in eyes wide open. Um, what's interesting about, if you take a look at a cattle rancher, they're grass farmers. You'll find invasive species control on a ranch. You'll find ground cover so our soil is not going into the ocean. You will find steward if he's wearing a cowboy hat, he's a steward or she's a steward because you, you're not bringing in huge in, inputs from the mainland. And so if you have a crop, in my view, where it takes 100% or nearly 100% of the inputs from elsewhere, don't tell me the crop or whatever you're producing is sustainable because when the ships stop, you stop. So you can, uh, in my view, market that, model that, however you want. But if the ships stop, your crop stops. If the ships stop, people can't eat. If the ships stop, it's not sustainable. The product's not sustainable. And so growing, the, doing the right things, and, and a lot of these, a laying hen will lay itself to death if you're not pumping it with the minerals and the, the things it needs to create the shell and keep an egg a day, an egg a day, an egg a day. And doing that, and so, those minerals, you don't mine here, you don't farm here, you don't pull out of the soil here, you don't pull out of where, you know, Hawaiian soil, and so that's coming in, and it's literally close to a quarter pound that a manure, and roughly a quarter to a third pound of feed, and then of course you have the byproducts that if you're not monitoring, if you're not having the Department of Health watch that, daily, weekly, whatever that case is. Are you stockpiling manure? Are you, where's your waste streams going? How's that working? If this were a town, they'd be doing that. There'd be systems and so on in place. There'd be studies that are required. So I firmly believe that you, I am 1,000% for growing our own food. I am 1,000% for our environment. And you can have both and you need both because if you don't have both in Hawaii, bad things happen. And so it's, uh, that's kind of 
it in a nutshell as far as our eggshell for this. Thank you. Um, so what, one question I have following on from that is everything that you're talking about here kind of alludes to a lack of infrastructure for waste streams, for slaughter. Oh, okay, sorry, is that better? So one thing that, you know, what you're speaking about alludes to a lack of infrastructure. I'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit about that in terms of waste management, slaughter, that kind of thing. Sure, the, um, I, I think the biggest concern is that you're gonna be a good neighbor, you're gonna have the environmental controls in place. That, that are going to protect the environment, protect the community, et cetera, and have that on the laws, have that through Department of Health, have that through Department of Ag. Let me, let me give you an insight into the Department of Ag. Um, Department of Ag holds roughly 303 people open positions. Right now, we're, we're roughly 100 people short. That's crazy. That's why Morris wears four to five hats. That's why most of the people down there should be wearing capes because they're still there fighting it out. And I was recently in conversations with one of their engineers and say, hey, we're trying to hire engineers. Like, well, what are you paying? I said, about 50 grand a year. And I said, I don't know anybody that'll do anything for 50 grand a year, let alone a college degree. And so if you don't fix that, you're not gonna fix ag. That's not just Department of Ag, that's DLNR. Everybody is around 30 plus percent understaffed to do the job. And so whether DHERD needs to get in place, the Department for Human Resources needs to get in place, these warriors in our state that, that do the good work that needs to be done need to be paid well to attract. If you get six months to onboard somebody, at the state level, we try to onboard in a week. So this is expedite, 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 expedite. We, you know, DHERT has some unusual rules that need to be changed. And again, you need the new people coming into the Senate and the House and changing those rules and moving that forward because we're not going to be able to guard and do the things and monitor the things that we need to monitor to protect our own, all industries. So. Um, I think first you got to do that. The other piece, I think, is there's a real reason for the Ahukua'a system with the wisdom that has, has been here for millennia. That you're on volcanic soil, everything goes to the ocean. You're on volcanic soil, everything soaks into the ground or goes to the ocean. Um, I, I don't think, in my view, Again, I'm not a farmer. I'm becoming a farmer, apparently. But in my view, producing, trying to produce all of the state's needs or all of a single island's need in one location, in my view, is a disastrous way to make things move forward. Communities need regional communities, ahupua'a type systems, that the community is engaged, the community's pouring into this. There's a collaborative, cooperative way because you have an ecosystem that is highly fragile, that needs that type of protection, that we're not gonna have concentrated areas that just basically are so dangerous that they could pollute and cause type, those types of problems. And so it needs to be that. That's why on the, uh, and I think we're gonna chat about this possibly, hopefully a little bit in a few minutes, but that's why I think you do do need the value-added centers that are regionally positioned, so smaller farmers. The food hub that came up during, food hubs that came up during COVID, I don't think people in general know just how on the edge we were and exposed to with the supply chain and all the things that were going up. So Brian Miyamoto and Farm Bureau and the food hubs and Kahumana and, and all the different groups that we work together and that we work side by side with volunteering the logistics and doing the things to move the food from the farms across the islands to the food distributions. Um, that was the Ahupua'a system in action that actually pulled our people in need and food insecure out of the COVID disaster 
that was. Um, and so I, I think just as a community, even the Ocala property in that place, it'd be wonderful to turn that into a fairy tale and not the nightmare that it turned into by bringing the community in there, working and doing the value add services and moving that towards a co-op and so on so we can all work together and use that and possibly some stuff on Whitmore and some of the other things we're talking about um, to move regionally across the state, which is a, a big push from uh, Senator Dela Cruz um, on, on, on moving things regionally and doing that across all islands. Yes, well, um, that kind of brings me to the next question you alluded to, Whitmore. Very interested in hearing about how that project's going, but then also a few other things that we've touched on. Um, in terms of livestock, feral livestock. You've been doing a lot of work on uh, Ni'ihau with the uh, antelope eland. Um, you're bringing sheep over from Ni'ihau. Uh, there's a lot of work going on on Maui with Maui Nui. Um, and I understand that you're shipping a lot of that. Um, so how can the food hubs, or sorry, the food hubs in work with these kind of spokes, spoken wheel kind of operations that you're talking about? How can livestock producers really benefit from that? And how can the greater food system benefit from those kind of things there? Sure. And as well, what's going on with more, please? <laughs> sure, so I'll, I'll start with the regional and the food hubs that we're talking about and that, that have been, these conversations started, food hub conversations started pre-COVID. Kind of marked my life on pre and post um, just because of the wild ride that that was. Um, the concept is, is that food input should come from multiple places, smaller farmers, that you'd have some, some, some equity between, if you're just the smallest farmer, or you got a mango tree, or whatever you have, or you've got a small patch, but you need to feed it into something bigger to value add, because people pay a lot more for a value added product than a box full of mangoes that you need to wash or whatever, and so, these regional centers, so on Oahu, you have um, the new product development center in Wahiwa. Again, that's Leeward Community College. That's uh, um, Senator Dela Cruz, again, pushing that in the Wahiwa community. So you can bring your great recipe, your products, your whatever, and work through with food scientists and the people necessary to move into that and, and develop your product, develop your packaging, and actually have a product that you can take to market food safety included. We're, through, we're in the second RFP for the Whitmore build out where we've targeted roughly a quarter million square feet of value added processing, cold storage, packaging, food safety, food safety in a hui setting. Nobody, a small farmer is not gonna afford, Kevin Kelly by the way wrote the book on this and Kevin Kelly what, what I don't think many people understand is you will never get to a Safeway, Walmart, Costco, Sam's Club. You won't get to any of these places unless you have the food safety third-party audits from the farm all the way. And so hooing that up, that's, that's, not a, uh, uh, that's not an option not to have. That, that's a requirement to get and feed our, our, our people. So have that at the center as well and build that so smaller operators can come in there and contribute their farm and get a known price, a set price uh, for their products to move into something that's gonna go, whether it's the DOE system, whether it's gonna go to market. Our trucks, our staff are in every, ro are in every grocery retailer club, ABC store on every island every day. And so, plugging that into how do you get to the markets, how do you move forward, going into other processed products, whether it's beef, whether it's lamb, um, having that the right food safety and value added processing. Every buyer that we work with on a daily basis, and that's every buyer in the state. Every buyer I know wants to buy local. Every buyer I know wants to champion local. Everybody wants to do that, and there's so few options to do that because you don't have the food safety, because you don't have the value add. And so that value add center, so you're growing elsewhere across the island and you're aggregating into a value add center where you're doing, because no farmer's gonna, very few farmers gonna go, I can afford the packaging equipment, I can afford the full-time food safety people. I can, nobody's saying that, very few people can do that. And so you're 
opening up farming. We've got 7,000 plus farmers in the state. Last we checked, and very few of them would be able to actually value add and do that. And so these regional centers that we're talking about need to happen, in my view, to be able to have local grocery, local produced food at the places that we purchase them. I should also clarify my definition of local food for local people is not going to be moved by the super fancy restaurant that rich tourists go to and pay for a great meal. It's not in a $7 carrot. It's in a piece of fruit or vegetable or lamb or beef or whatever that is that a single parent with children can go in and choose because you have the economies of scale, because you have the critical mass necessary to lower the cost and bring that value in um, so they can buy that as a choice versus whatever options we've had before. It's super sexy to say, hey, chef, where'd you get this product from? And they point to a farm down the road, but it's not going to move the needle. If you want to move the needle and take care of our own people, you need to have the economies of scale to do so. Um, going to jump to Maui Nui, going to jump to the antelope. We just had a millionaire's yacht come off a crash into the coral in a, in a preserve, right? And that was on social media everywhere. And, and then after it left and got towed and sunk, everybody kind of cheered. When that happened, divers went in, local guys went in, snorkeled, showed all the damage to the reef and saw what was going on. If you saw, we've, we just, uncontrolled ungulates, access deer, Maui, access deer, Molokai, access deer, Lanai. Uncontrolled ungulates do more damage in a minute than that ship did. If, if, if millionaires did that in what the access deer does to our nearshore waters, uh, there wouldn't be any millionaires left. It would be hunting season because it, it's just so tragic. When, you know, we recently flew into Molokai and uh, we were meeting with the ranchers, and they're dealing with the stuff they were going. And we were with uh, the chair appointee, Sharon Hurd, um, to meet face to face in a field with angry ranchers. Um, and so we're there, roughly four hours, going back and forth, and trying to go. How do we help them get through their problem, and what's going on, and and to help them get feed, and so on. As we're flying in, you're on the south shore of Molokai. It's only mud. It's hundreds of hundreds of yards of only mud in the ocean. It's all mud. The coral's dead. The coral's been dead for a long time. The hillsides are bare. There's no grass. It's going to be almost impossible to bring grass back on there. There's no, you're not going to fish off there. You're never going to fish off there in the next 50 years. And so if you don't control that access deer, if you don't control the uncontrolled ungulates, you're not going to have that. So Maui Nui, by the way, the rock star butcher, Brian, who now just automatically looked down instead of caught my gaze, is back there with the tattoos on the arms and the nice sleeves, um, is one of the top butchers of all things, small carcass animals, any animal, um, and helped Maui Nui put this program together. I think you folks did over 10,000 access deers in 2022 and growing. And that's going as a, as a unique protein source, harvesting them, turning them into food. It's an amazing product. We started doing this, you know, yes, we picked up the dairy during COVID for the exact same reasons the slaughterhouse was gonna close in Makawele. that was handling the lamb and Elan from Niihau. Elan is an antelope and culling some cows for the ranchers in Kauai. They were gonna close. I used the same line of thinking, which was not thinking, and I took that over as well. We're putting the improvements through, but that's to control the ungulates that are going and turn those into a food source. And so um, I, I think there's a tremendous benefit to doing that. I know there's some bills going on as far as small animal harvesting that's in the Senate right now, um, desperately needed because you have these opportunities to take care of that and take care of the environment at the same time. So you're creating a food source off of something that's destroying the environment. 
by harvesting the axis deer and, and some other things and turning those into food for people. By the way, Maui Nui, alongside of, of HFA, they gave away tremendous amounts of venison from the access steer to people in need and working with, including uh, the Hawaiian communities in, in, in Maui and doing a lot of just heroic work. Jake Muse should, you know, we should have a holiday once a year in Hawaii for Jake because of what he's developed with his wife Ku'u and all that's gone on there. So it's just been an amazing experience to work alongside those. By the way, that's our biggest export to the mainland. We put those in containers, have carcass, we load those up and we've shipped them to all four ports as he continues to build demand for access deer and feel that we really are starting to turn the tide on that in Maui and working for that. And they've moved value added processing up there as well. I think I covered all, but I'm not sure. Um, we, we are running really short on time, so I'll just ask one final question. Um, I was doing a bit of a refresher last night, watching uh, Ketchup and M&Ms. I'm sure many of you have seen that. Um, in that, you said Hawaii's never really given enough thought, consideration to agriculture, never. Um, I'm wondering since then, you know, since you were in front of that camera, now in front of ours, thank you, um, has anything changed? I think COVID was one of the toughest things that happened to Hawaii, and I think it was also one of the best things that happened to Hawaii. You wouldn't, my family would have, most families would have never experienced Hawaii the way it could be, the way it should be, until COVID came along. We didn't even want to come anywhere close to Waikiki. And during COVID, it was one of the most beautiful places on planet Earth, as it was 100% local people enjoying the surf, enjoying one another. There were no assholes on waves. This was just pure delight as people enjoyed. And I'm all for tourism. I am not for over tourism. Um, and and I think when you have, if you if you invite people over for a pool party and you got ten people in the pool, you have a party. You put a hundred people in the pool, you got a whole different story, and you don't want to know what's in the water. And I think we've hit a limit that we need to really start to control how we market Hawaii, and it's a premium destination that actually requires respect to come in. That we raise our family and our children and school our children to do great things and not just clean rooms. And so clearly, I've got a different agenda here as well. But I'm, when, when you take a look at what happened in COVID, we saw that, we saw just how desperately we needed food and we didn't prepare for ourselves and, and just how woefully unprepared we were. And I, my hope was, one of the Congresswomen's staff members was in my office just before we shut down the state and said, I think we're gonna shut down the state. And I said, ha, there's no way in hell we're ever gonna shut down this state to the economic driver that's coming. And two weeks later, we were shut down. Tuesday night, everybody out of the pool, everybody leave and everybody went home. And, and so the, what that was for me was that was a lesson that we can make hard decisions. And I think our future is gonna take hard decisions a future that's worth being here, a future that includes our children. Is gonna take hard decisions and hard leaderships, hard leaders, uh, hard decisions made by real leaders that stick up for the people that actually care for our own and make a Hawaii that's worth staying in. Because every time our children leave, they take us with them. We lose a bit of Hawaii every time they don't come back. And so how do we do that? And so my hope was is that as this is happening, as we watched COVID happen and, and all the things that were taking place, I was like, when we get out of COVID, we're gonna have enough will, we're gonna have enough steel in our spine to make a difference, to make the hard decisions and really stick up for Hawaii and put the controls into place. And I don't know if I believe we still, if, I think we're forgetting COVID too fast. I think we're forgetting the things that we learned and the lessons that we learned. And it's really a shame if we go back to promoting Hawaii as a discounted 
destination is and doing the things and not caring for our own and not housing our own and not doing the things that need to happen to put roofs over the heads. Um, you know, we're one of the largest employers of the formerly incarcerated in Hawaii. You got a 10% Hawaiian population, but if you're in prison, it's a 30% population. And that is desperately, desperately, desperately wrong. I don't know how we live with ourselves to be able to do that, but I can tell you in my experience with everybody that we work with on a daily basis, the common denominator is a lethal loss of hope. That why should I try? I'm never gonna afford that million dollar medium price home. I'm not gonna be able to have a wife and children. If I do, my wife and I need to work. We'll need to work multiple jobs and so that everything's slipping away. And so the things that fill that, whether it's drugs or crime or Whatever fills that is only filling a void that is left there from a lethal loss of hope. And so building that back up is gonna take a tremendous amount of effort. It's gonna take a tremendous amount of leadership. I'm, I find great joy in some of the new leaders in the Senate and the new leaders in the House that actually care, are paying attention, and advocate for our own. And so I'm, I'm uh, uh, you know, I, th I think at some point we'll talk about recovery pods at another venue somewhere oh, we sh we're, we're out of time okay so so there's hope there's new leadership um, there does need to be guardrails and guidelines and I, I think together um, we can move forward with this but uh, thanks for taking the time to kind of talk about this important topic